Hello, my name is Kate Partridge. I am a Senior Associate in the London Privacy Team at Field Fisher, and I am joined by my colleague, Eleanor Dews. Today, we are presenting to you a session on how to put in place standard contractual clauses following the recent SHREMS 2 CJEU decision. You may be a regular listener of our Field Fisher Get Data Protection Fit series. If you are, welcome, and thank you for joining us again today. If you're a new listener, hello and also welcome. The Field Fisher team have been presenting a number of sessions on data protection over the last couple of months, and Eleanor and I hope you find today's session helpful to your practice. In this module 2B, the team are focused on putting data protection into practice. Today's session is a little bit of a change from our schedule, as the fallout from the SHREMS decision has many practical implications for privacy practitioners. Our focus today is solely on what this means for the standard contractual clauses. If you want to find out further information about the Privacy Shield implications, or a general overview of the case itself, we recommend you also listen to our Field Fisher webinar on this topic, SHREMS 2, The Practical Implications. By the end of today's session, you should be better able to put in place standard contractual clauses in a compliant manner, be able to deal pragmatically with the mini adequacy assessment, and assess what supplementary measures you may need in order to put standard contractual clauses in place. We've structured today's session into four parts. Eleanor will be taking you through what standard of protection are we aiming at, assessing compliance with the clauses, the verification process or mini adequacy assessment, then I will be taking you through supplementary measures that may be needed in addition to the standard contractual clauses you have in place. I will now hand you over to Eleanor to examine what standard of protection we are aiming at. Thank you very much, Kate, and hello, everyone, and welcome. So what do the Court of Justice of the European Union, or CJU, say in the Schrems 2 case about the standard of protection that we're aiming at when we transfer data to a country outside the EU or the UK? What needs to be achieved? Well, the court said that the level of protection in the GDPR shouldn't be undermined just because the data has been transferred. So the standard that we're aiming at is a standard which is essentially equivalent to the standard that applies in the EU and the UK. So I'm now going to move on to look at what the court said about the standard contractual clauses. We're all quite used to the idea that the standard contractual clauses are helpful because we sign them, and then we have our transfer mechanism in place. And a lot of us ended up putting that in the drawer. So the standard contractual clauses were there, and we didn't really worry anymore about that issue of how to transfer the data. Court said, that's not acceptable. What we've got to do is to take the standard contractual clauses seriously and really ensure that we're adhering to them. And what does this mean? It means that on an ongoing basis, both the data exporter and the importer need to work together in order to make sure that the standard contractual clauses are being complied with and that that essentially equivalent test is being met in terms of the protection afforded to data subjects and their personal data. So it's a two-way street for the exporter in the importer. They're both responsible for this, and it isn't just the exporter in the EU or the UK who's responsible for complying with the standard contractual clauses and ensuring the protections are there. So looking in a little bit more detail now, 
the real question is, can you really comply with the standard contractual clauses? And when we start to look at them in that depth, uh, we realize that they're actually really quite onerous. And so I'm just going to take you through a few examples that the court mentioned of the clauses and exactly what they require you to do. So they require you to look closely at the national legislation that the importer is subject to. And this example is from the footnote clause five. So it says that the importer will of course be subject to some mandatory legislation in its jurisdiction, but that legislation needs to be looked at and there needs to be careful consideration about exactly what it requires. So the question is, is it necessary? Is it proportionate? And does that proportionate safeguard apply in the context of national security, defense, public security, the protection of the data subject, or the rights and freedoms of others? And it's only if that legislation is proportionate that it's not in contradiction with the standard contractual clauses. How do you go about doing that? How do you go about this assessment of the mandatory legislation and ensuring it's proportionate? That's so difficult. And I think one of the themes that comes out of the judgment is the fact that the court's looking very much at the legislation and the legislative obligations, but it's not thinking practically about how exporters and importers actually do things on the ground and how the clauses really are used in practice. So continuing with this particular theme, what is it that is uh, acceptable in terms of the standard contractual clauses when you're looking at that mandatory legislation? What subject matter does it cover? Well, the standard contractual clauses themselves explain that an example of legislation that might be appropriate is internationally recognized sanctions, tax reporting requirements or anti-money laundering reporting requirements. And those all have to be proportionate in order for them to be acceptable and not in contradiction with the standard contractual clauses. So as we say, that's a huge challenge to go through that assessment. And also your compliance has to be ongoing. It's not, as I said, a question of just putting the standard contractual clauses in the drawer, you have to keep assessing, are we actually going to be able to comply with the clauses and the obligations that they set out? And the importer has to notify the exporter of any changes in legislation. So any changes perhaps in anti-money laundering legislation that might mean that in fact, the standard contractual clauses can no longer be complied with. And the importer has to tell the exporter if they can't comply if it's now impossible to afford the essentially equivalent protections to the relevant data in that jurisdiction where the importer is situated. Another example of the difficulties which a really close reading of the standard contractual clauses shows in terms of compliance is in the context of law enforcement requests. So, the standard contractual clauses recognize that the importer may be subject to law enforcement requests and may also be prohibited from telling the exporter that they're subject to those requests. So the standard contractual clauses require the importer to notify the exporter that a law enforcement request has been received unless that's prohibited. And of course, these requests can actually be secret in the sense that the importer is not allowed to explain to the exporter what's happening, and if they do, there could be a criminal sanction attached. So the clauses recognize this, but in that situation, rather than being explicit about what's happening, the importer simply has to tell the exporter, I can no longer comply with the standard contractual clauses. If the recipient, the importer, can't comply with the standard contractual clauses, then the exporter has to terminate the contract. So this is really key, I think, um, and this is something that the court really brought out, that it's absolutely essential that 
if the standard contractual clauses can't be complied with in reality, then that's the end really of, of that contractual relationship. And if the controller doesn't take steps to end the contractual relationship, then the supervisory authority in the particular jurisdiction needs to step in and either suspend or prohibit the transfer. Now, we all know that GDPR is about harmonization and having the same rules and the same regulatory approach right across the EU. And so we anticipate, and the court also pointed to this, that any decisions to suspend or prohibit a transfer may well need to go through the consistency mechanism of the EDP. So this is going to be potentially a lengthy and complex process. So that brings us to the end of the sort of deep dive into some aspects of the standard contractual clauses and how difficult they really are to comply with when you, when you look at them in that way. So that was the first step that the Court of Justice required you to go through when looking at the standard contractual clauses. And the second step, the verification process, is also relatively problematic and complex. Now, what the court said is that when you're looking at the jurisdiction to which you want to transfer the data, then you have to consider a whole list of elements. And these are the same elements that the European Commission takes into account when it's deciding whether a third country is adequate from the point of view of data transfers. So examples of what you'd have to look at would be the rule of law in the third country, the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, and even the international commitments of the third country. How is any business really supposed to be able to do this when this really is a task we all thought, which was aimed at the European Commission and which we know the European Commission takes several months to complete? So our advice is that this step is simply so onerous that for most businesses, you're better off simply taking the view that your mini adequacy assessment will result in the jurisdiction that you want to transfer the data to failing that mini adequacy test. Because otherwise, you are going to have to do this analysis, which really, quite frankly, is just so complex and resource intensive. So Unless you're a very prominent business, you're very prominent in the market, or potentially you're in a jurisdiction where the regulator takes a very strict view, we recommend that you miss out this very difficult step. And you move on instead to thinking about the supplementary measures you could put in place to protect the data to that essentially equivalent standard which ought talked about. So I'm now going to hand back to Kate to talk about those supplementary measures and what they look like. Thank you, Eleanor. The CJEU was clear that as standard contractual clauses cannot bind the public authorities of third countries, it may be necessary, depending on that particular third country, to include an additional level of protection to ensure that the rights granted to individuals under EU law and the Charter are not undermined, as Eleanor referred to earlier, the essential equivalence test. The judgment re referenced Recital 109 of the GDPR, which states that in particular, the controller should be encouraged to provide additional safeguards that supplement standard data protection clauses. The EDPB FAQs released following the judgment stated the supplementary measures have to be provided on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account all the circumstances of the transfer following the assessment of the law in the third country. However, the EDPB is currently analysing the court's judgment to determine the kind of supplementary measures that could be provided in addition to the standard contractual clauses. And this is where we are left hanging. So what we have now are some practical ideas about what kinds of supplementary measures data exporters and importers using standard contractual clauses may wish to consider. So firstly, as the EDPB indicated, the context of the particular transfer is key. 
and it will be helpful to consider the following factors. The nature of the data exporter and data importer and why is the data being exported in the first place? Purely for storage, some form of IT support or because the exporters and importers are part of a multinational corporation? Are there any sectorial or industry rules governing the data processing? such as banking or finance regulations or specific sectorial codes. Consider whether the data importer has any history of conceding to government data access requests and also looking at the categories of data subjects affected by the export. For example, employees, children or vulnerable people. Also looking at the categories of personal data affected by the export in particular, if there are any special categories of data. So once we have an understanding of context, there are several categories in which we think importers and exporters could implement supplementary measures. These are via contractual mechanisms, technical mechanisms, policy measures, and if relevant, continued adherence to the privacy shield. Some of the contractual measures uh, might include restriction of importers access rights. It's not uncommon to restrict access to a need to know basis. Uh, further details and structure of this could be given uh, in your contractual relationship. For example, naming individuals and controls around when and how access can and should occur. You could put specific approval requirements for maintenance works and also consider, consider contractual structures for dealing with government requests or even an approval process um, to be put in place by the importer. Some of the technical measures may include placing your data centre in the EU with highly restricted and documented controllable and possibly even read only access from abroad, end-to-end -end encryption during the transfer itself to prevent access, and if possible, the key to encryption would remain in the EU or the UK. You could even consider if additional encryption or synonymization to the data itself is appropriate, and also consider on-device processing to minimize data that's exported from any device. In terms of policy measures, you could consider limiting the categories of data exported with a focus on not transmitting any sensitive data from particularly vulnerable groups, such as children. You could have stricter and shorter deletion periods for data processed by the importer or avoid local storage. For example, this could mean the importer processing data upon receipt and then immediately deleting the data. In addition to the contractual measures I've just mentioned, you could document your law enforcement access regime. For example, only permitting the importer to provide data when this is required under a court order. And you could also consider, or the importer could consider publishing transparency reports which show the level of government access requests, where this is lawful to do so, of course. Although it is important to note that data may be accessed by intelligence agency before it arrives at its destination and without the importer's knowledge. One option, although not practicable for many, is storing the data in the EU or the UK only. And this is extremely expensive to do and doesn't solve the problem if there is ever going to be any non-EU access to the data centre. But if your organisation is at the start of the process of configuring its business, then this might be different and it might be helpful to consider storing the data in the EU. Although the Privacy Shield can no longer be used as a transfer mechanism, it does afford some safeguards which could apply in addition to the standard contractual clauses. For example, it has an arbitration mechanism for data subjects. There is the assistance of the ombudsperson. There is the appearance of review and sign off by the DOC. And there is the assurance of the FTC oversight. 
So we've now considered the context of the transfer and the four categories where we think importers and exporters could implement supplementary measures. And now we're thinking about what standard of protection should be taken. I think a goal of full compliance is unrealistic and extremely challenging for many of the reasons that both Eleanor and I have talked about already. I think this is particularly so in the absence of a political solution or further regulatory guidance. So rather importers and exporters should ensure they have a defensible position and to be able to present themselves as having given thought to and having taken responsible steps to address a complex problem. The steps importers and exporters will need to take should be proportionate to the risks they face as a business depending on their size and prominence in the marketplace. However, we should be mindful that any steps taken now may need to be modified because of future regulatory guidance. We should also keep in mind anticipated future developments, such as the new modular standard contractual clauses from the European Commission. However, these are also likely to necessitate some form of supplementary measures. We've now reached the end of today's session. Now you should be better able to put in place standard contractual clauses in a compliant manner, to be able to deal pragmatically with the mini adequacy assessment and assess what supplementary measures you need. Thank you for your time and we hope you've enjoyed listening to our session today.